I'm Julie Arliss from Academy Conferences. I'm here at the University of Aberdeen with Professor Tom Greggs and I'm going to ask him a few questions about um, pluralism and the um, increasing march of secularisation in culture. Um, so Tom, uh, Professor Tom, <laughs> um, one of the things that young people will say to me is that religions are basically, fundamentally, all the same and should all be given the same kind of value and respect and that's what we should aim for. How, how would you respond to that? It's a really complicated and a really good question, Julie. I think there's a lot of different angles to take this from. But the first thing that I always want to point out to students is that the category of religion and as a thing is in some ways an extraordinarily modern category. And it's a category that presupposes some kind of general generic approach to the topic of spirituality, otherness, whatever you might want to say. A kind of lowest common denominator approach, an idea that you can reduce everything to a basic essence. And once you get things to that essence, then you've identified this mythical thing called religion. The problem that I have with that as an approach, though, is, that, is a very concrete one, which is whenever anybody goes into hospital or whenever they fill in a form where it says religion, colon, no one says yes or no. They give a very specific answer. So they'll say Sikh or Hindu or Christian, even maybe whatever type of Christian they are, or Muslim or whatever else. Um, everybody offers a discrete description of the tradition that they arise from, the religion that they arise from. And then it's very difficult actually to identify what the commonality is between all of these things. You might say, well, it's God. But that's not really quite true either once you get into Eastern religions, lots of atheistic religions. Um, so the question for me maybe isn't a question about how you find this lowest common denominator, because I'm not sure that people that other people would define as religious would necessarily use that description of themselves as a primary identifier. They'd say, I'm Muslim or I'm Jewish. And as soon as you begin to make that type of statement, you're making an exclusive statement. You're talking about the community that you belong to, the traditions that you're inheriting. You're talking about particular understandings of authority that work in certain ways. Um, that's not to say that I think that you should um, in any way be disrespectful of other religions if you stand from within it, but I think what you need to do from within your own religious tradition is to try to find accounts of how to be generous, how to be positive, how to be understanding towards the other, rather than working on some kind of binarised category of the religious or the secular of either you're religious or you're irreligious. I, I'm not actually sure how far that mm -hmm. description takes us. Um, mm -hmm. One other way to come at it, so to talk to you, but one other way to come at it is to say that you could say that the category of the religious is in and of itself an invention of the secular. So it's only a meaningful category as soon as you say there is space or there are a set of ideas or there's a set of thoughts in which people's identity in relation to their faith doesn't belong. So there's an area that we call the secular space mm. in which religious people don't belong. And, and that begins to define this other area of religion. They're symbiotic um, in their relationship to one another. They rely on each other. You can't have the secular without a concept of the religious. Mm -hmm. but I'd equally want to say that, you, that really the idea of the religious is something that is invented predominantly, I guess, in the 19th century uh, through the rise of secular thought uh, and secular powers. Does that, does that make sense? Yes and no, because <clears throat> whilst I understand, understand your point, there are different world religions. Mm -hmm. And if you're a member of a world religion, um, is, this an, is this an appropriate attitude? Is, would it be your recommendation that you value other religions and other world religions, other world faiths, um, as having something to offer you or, or not? So should, should you be willing to learn from other world religions if you get from a position of faith in one particular one? So you've got, a, from a position of faith that you hold, I think you should always have a degree of openness, a degree of confidence in what you believe to be able to be open to somebody mm -hmm. else. In fact, the people that are least open are usually those who are least confident. You know, that if, if you've put very thin foundations down, it's easier for your... Mm -hmm tower to be toppled than it is if you have very deep ones um, and, and perhaps the deeper the foundations that you have the, the more open you can be mm -hmm. to others 
I, I think I just, I understand academically why we come up with this idea of a world religion. Um, I think I just struggle with that as an insider self-description of how anybody understands themselves. I think it would be very difficult to find, say, a Jane and say, uh, what are you? And they say, I belong to a world religion as their primary identifier. Mm. Um, for me, I, I always want to step back and say, what, what do, how do religious people, in inverted commas, mm. self-understand? Uh, and what makes something distinct from, uh, what makes a religion distinct, say, from something like um, a humanist organisation? So we now have a situation in London, in fact we have a colleague here who's done some research on this, where you have secular communities meeting together almost as a church, in inverted commas, um, listening, having time in meditation and quiet, perhaps having the equivalent of a sermon. You now have secular funerals, uh, humanist funerals, secular weddings. Um, all the things that we might identify as belonging to a religion, we actually find an equal and opposite sphere. It's part of the reason why these things are symbolic. I, I do realise I'm being slightly <laughs> academic and pernickety, about this, but I, I just think that before we move to a generic category or the genus, we're always better to start with the individual instantiation of something mm -hmm. and to think from there. And I think for me in the current world, the best thing that we can do as in inverted commas religious people is to think from within our traditions about what our traditions teach us in their own way about what it means to be peaceful, good citizens of the world because imposing something from outside will never quite capture mm. those people who say no my primary identity is my own faith you have to justify this on the grounds of the faith that i hold so what about tension between different faiths yeah so you know we live in a century that's probably um in some ways the most religious century that we've had since the 16th century maybe um, uh, and the 17th century since the Reformation and the wars of religions that followed from that. And the 20th century was a remarkably secular century. Religion seemed to have disappeared from the public yeah. agenda and imagination. And the 21st century started incredibly differently. Um, for me, the question is, if tension is happening on the grounds of the most intense, or supposedly the most intense, let's put a big underline under supposedly, mm -hmm. expressions of a faith community. If the tension is happening between these two intense expressions of a faith community, you know, extremely um, um, committed Christians, let's say, and extremely committed, whatever else that might be, Buddhists one might find, say, in someone else, Rebecca. If it's extremely intense versions of that, I think the way of dealing with tension is not to come in from outside and say, actually what we've got to do is remove mm -hmm. your religion, you need to dial your religion back, because all that, that will do is dial the religion up. Mm -hmm. Unhealthy secular theory, unhealthy extreme versions of secularism will feed into unhealthy extreme versions of religion, and mm -hmm. so the cycle goes on. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the other way around, what I think we need to do is to say, what is there within your tradition that helps you to overcome this tension. Mm -hmm. So some of my own research, for example, has been on um, the way in which Jesus lived within a pluralist context mm -hmm. in his own age. Mm -hmm. As a Christian theologian, the way that I am most intensely a Christian theologian surely has to be by dealing with my scriptures, by dealing with Jesus Christ as the core, the, the exclusive identifier of my faith. But what is there within what Jesus says, within the way that he behaves, that shows me that to be a good Christian, to be a good follower of Christ, doesn't involve having tension and aggression towards the other who isn't a Christian, but actually involves being loving, supportive, caring, compassionate, mm -hmm. and learning from them. Uh, the story of the Good Samaritan mm -hmm. is a place where I go for that. But there are some Christian groups who, who believe that only Christians can be saved, mm -hmm. and that they have, they have a you know very kind of exclusivist picture mm -hmm. of of their particular brand of Christianity. So how 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 can you respond? How can you deal with that? How, what kind of response could we make to that kind of closing down the doors? And nobody else can be saved. 
It's a, that's a great question. That's a, a large part of my research was on for 15 years or so. Um, I think I want to differentiate between two types of exclusivisms. Okay. And, I, and I think this is one area in the way in which this material is often taught, where we don't make a differentiation between the two. Um, I would want to differentiate between exclusivism as it relates to revelation, mm -hmm. so as it relates to the exclusive claims of a faith, the way in which they understand the self unveiling of God and God's purposes with the world, and exclusivism as it relates to salvation, mm -hmm. who it is that ends up in heaven, because I don't think they're necessarily the yeah, same things, and very often they're conflated together. Um, I would say traditionally they're conflated together, and the other way in which we teach this sometimes is that we, we seem to presume that only these evil, awful extremists think that, you know, not everybody goes to heaven, um, not everybody is saved. Of course, the vast majority of people throughout the vast majority of Christian history and the vast majority of people who believe in Christianity now would make that claim in some kind of way. You know, that's with nuance, um, basically the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant churches, which are Orthodox and so forth. That, so it's not an extreme position to hold that necessarily. I, I really struggle with that mm -hmm. as a position on the grounds of salvation as a, as a Christian. Uh, I always want to articulate the broader hope. But how I would want to deal with those people is not to say, well, actually what you need to do is realize that we live in a society that's pluralist, let the cultural conditions of the age determine the way that you understand your faith, dial it down, reduce it to a lowest common denominator, wipe away the kind of uncomfortable edges of it. Uh, let's all not be bothered about being um, Christian. Let's be concerned about being religious, or let's be concerned even beyond that about being decent people. I think you get that kind of idea in Hick with his, mm -hmm. sort of, that's a very crude presentation of it, but mm -hmm. with his pluralism. What I want to say is, what, what can you learn if you take the exclusive claims of Christianity in terms of revelation seriously about a broader hope for everybody else? about the way in which you understand other people. What does it mean for Jesus as a Jewish human being in Palestine, uh, Israel-Palestine in the first century to say of a Roman centurion who would have believed in the pantheon of gods mm -hmm. that he's seen more faith in that person mm -hmm. than anyone else that he's come across. Here's, a, here's somebody who believes in Zeus and all of these sorts of people. What does it mean to take that seriously? What does it mean for St. Paul to say, as everybody dies in Adam, so everybody is raised in Christ? So I don't think you have to have a position where you either give up on Christianity and central doctrinal tenets, what we sometimes call in Protestant circles, solus Christus, the idea of Christ mm -hmm. being at the center. I don't think you necessarily have to give up on that to have a broader hope of uh, a broader understanding of the way in which salvation works. So, um, some people could be saved without knowing Christ? Yeah, or, or you could say that, um, well, yeah, let's, let's go with two answers to that. You could say yes on one, just this the two on this one. You could say yes on one hand, that yeah. absolutely, that there is a difference between um, the epistemic between what we know about something and the ontological mm -hmm. what really is so as much as I might close my eyes and say Mongolia doesn't exist Mongolia doesn't exist Mongolia doesn't exist of course Mongolia exists mm -hmm. but what I believe about that doesn't affect the reality of it and I think I would want to say the same thing with regard to faith that um, faith for me is about understanding reality as it is yeah. it doesn't alter reality it doesn't mean that you are saved because of something you believe, as if you're signing a contract. What you are believing is the reality of the way in which God interacts with the creation. So that, that would be one way of approaching it. The other way would be to say, which is a bit more in line with, say, somebody like Rana, although it's a slight inversion of the way that Rana talks about it. One way to talk about it in a more inclusivist way would be to say that people might meet Christ unknowingly that actually in any good they do, any time that their humanity reflects the humanity of Christ, they are fulfilling the Christian faith. They, are, they do actually know Christ. They can't name Christ as such. So in the same way that you might say a baby would know its mother or its grandparents, but it couldn't name or give information, nevertheless, there is that degree of relationship. And would there, in that view, be any superiority ascribed to those who are in Christ. 
So, for example, if you go to a Hindu temple, they'll very often greet you as um, a Christian Hindu. Mm -hmm. so they're we're, we're happy to welcome you as a Hindu in disguise. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be what you've just outlined there. S sort of. I mean, it, 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 it's different if you belong to... A if you're a polytheist, isn't it? Because if you're a polytheist, you can always add a god in. <laughs> okay. And that, that's the case, you see this in, in the case in Rome, that when Rome, over, when Rome takes over any area, the reason why Rome believes it has superiority over all the other nations is because it recognises and venerates the local gods of the place that's taken over. So, you know, Christ might well be another god amongst the pantheon if you're, if you're a polytheist. If you're a monotheist, there's always going to be some degree of exclusive claim. Right. But, <laughs> yeah. but monotheism, to say that there is only one God, which Christians, Jews and Muslims would all say, is both an exclusive claim, mm -hmm. because it says there's only one God, that's a God that I believe in, but it's also a universal claim, because there is only one God. Right. So if anybody is praying to God, right. who else can they be praying to other than the one God? So... Monotheism works in either way. Where I would see an advantage of those who are, you might say, I like the language of actively in Christ or something, or mm -hmm. consciously in Christ, is maybe just peace. Mm -hmm. It's maybe just the idea that, you know, I, I can live my life without fear of what happens after death. There might be huge existential benefits mm -hmm. to knowing the gospel, to feeling that you, um, you know, as somebody who takes funerals occasionally, that it, it, there's, there's a degree of peace that comes for people who feel that they know what their end is. That it might just be an existential expression of it, rather than dying in fear or dying mm -hmm. unknowing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So, Professor Greggs, I was wondering if you might um, give us some thoughts on Bart and Bonhoeffer. Uh, I've always seen Bart, possibly mistakenly, as a bit of an exclusivist. Is that your take? Uh, it, it is. I think Bart overturns all of the categories. Okay. Uh, I think probably the best way to understand Bart is to see him against the background of the 19th century. Okay. And what you have in the 19th century is a move to, the, to a discussion of the essence of Christianity. You have the emergence of the idea of religion as a theological category, that what all of these people have in common is religion, and that might be the essence of Christianity. What Schleiermacher, Bart's great uh, hero, but also the person that Bart opposes most fiercely, what Steinmecker call, calls the sense and taste for the infinite, the gefuel, the feeling that you have. And Bart wants to overturn that because what Bart is aware of is all of the critique that comes to that. The critique particularly from Feuerbach, uh, Ludwig Feuerbach, perhaps the father of modern atheism. I think the, a great genius who said, when religious people talk about God, what they're actually doing is talking about themselves. So when they talk about God being powerful, what they're doing is trying to ascribe to themselves power. When they talk about God being everlasting, what they're doing is talking about their own desire to be everlasting. It's a psychological analysis that takes place. Uh, Bart recognises that and wants to oppose it. And he says that Jesus Christ is, and he uses this really technical uh, German word, our fearbung der Religion. The, um, we translate it sometimes destruction, but it's actually a word that's used by the philosopher Hegel, mm -hmm. and it means maybe sublimation or something. Destroy something to reconstitute it in a different way. Um, so for Bart, Bart sees Jesus Christ as uniquely, exclusively, the way in which we might understand um, who God is, what God does, but he says that this isn't altogether a message of God's yes to humanity. That God becoming human includes every human being right. within that. So although it's extraordinarily exclusivist mm -hmm. and it's epistemologically exclusivist, Bart would say the only way that you have access to this is through knowledge of Jesus Christ. The scripture is very Protestant in that way, very classically Protestant in that way. But he says that in Jesus Christ, every human being is captured. And he actually has a very advanced understanding of the of eternity in relation to that and says. That eternity is a perfect, he uses Boethius as category of eternity, the perfect simultaneous possession of unending life. Right. And what that means is, if you imagine an infinitely long piano, every note being played at once. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, Bart doesn't just have a sequential understanding of what happens. Mm -hmm. It's not simply that um, human beings are created, we stuff up, as a result of that God goes for plan B. 
Uh, for what Bart would say is, no, it's not just the case that Jesus Christ comes because of creation. Creation comes because of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That God's willing to be for another is expressed in Jesus Christ and all humanity is contained in Jesus Christ. He is the first human. Right. It's not that we, it's not that he shares our humanity in a sense, it's that we share mm -hmm. his perfect humanity. So kind of John's prologue. A bit like John's prologue, yeah. So he takes that, I mean, that, if there's one verse that's important to Bart, it's um, John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. That, 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 that is the absolute core of his theology. It is for other major theologians like mm -hmm. Athanasius mm -hmm. and at, at, but all of humanity is included in that. So Bart is, but because Bart also offers a critique of religion, Bart says that the critique of religion as a category has to be applied to Christians most of all. Right. So the fact that Christians have been shown by Christ mm -hmm. that our desire to get to God is, is insufficient, isn't, isn't the right way to go about things, and we still do it, determines that Christians stand judged most of all. So Christians, in their attitude towards other religions, in inverted commas, should be peaceful, tolerant, kind, gracious, aware of their own foibles and failings. Mm -hmm. And that, in that way, you could see Bart as, as deeply exclusivist, mm -hmm. deeply inclusivist, and in a sense, also deeply pluralist, because what he's saying is, yeah. you know what? Everybody is liable and culpable of this, yeah. and what Christ does is to invert it, is to destroy it, is to show that we shouldn't look for what it means for a human being to be made in the image of God. Mm -hmm but we should think about what it means to speak of the uh, eternal humanity of God that yes. exists in Jesus Christ. I had never thought of it that way. Brilliant. Great. Thank you so much. That Thank would you. be really helpful Thank you. for when I go back to school and have to explain it to my students. <laughs> Lovely talking to you. Okay, Thank you. Thank you.